hands. That seems to be the key topic. And so I, I thought we'd have a quick look at uh, a lot of hand-holding that's been going on um, amongst politicians. And you can see that hand-holding is used for a whole range of purposes. Uh, one is to guide, uh, this, this lady on the left is guiding this rather lost-looking gentleman on her right, or her left, uh, it's not sure where. And then we've got uh, Nelson Mandela thinking, what can I do that will embarrass Tony Blair? I'll hold his hand, and you can see Tony doesn't quite know what to do with that. Um, and then we've got North and South Korea, who are now best friends. Isn't it fantastic what you can do with just a hand across the water? Um, and we'll see more of the other two gentlemen later on. Um, it, as you probably know, um, this is all part of the European semester of psychology. I don't know how much longer we can use that phrase based in this country. Hopefully we, we can for uh, as long as is possible. Um, and this is what it says on the website about what um, the European semester for psychology means. Uh, you can see some interesting relationships between personality traits and not just uh, their, their ideas about control, but their experiences of the job. And actually to the point where those scoring high in conscientiousness decided to stand down, many of them. What does that say about who's left? Um, I just pose the question. Very quickly, Brexit, because I, I was told it's a good idea to mention Brexit, so there's a slide with the word Brexit got to do on it, but again, affecting MPs. I was asked to go to the House of Commons this week and meet with a group who were talking about what might happen next. Um, and one of the issues raised was, should there be another vote? Um, personally, not that my view is important at all, I'm kind of thinking, well, democracy is democracy. People have made a decision. I guess you could say there's a decision yet to be made about the terms of leaving. And let's hope that leaving doesn't include severing ties and setting sail and actually taking the island out into the Atlantic, which, if you believe the media, seems to be what some of the rhetoric is talking about. But the International Society of Political Psychology is 40 years old. Last year, we, we went there and launched a collaboration with the Political Studies Association. Um, and not to have a UK political studies, political um, psychology group, it seemed like a, a bit of an omission. So I hope you'll help put that right. There's a picture of some people there. Um, and it was either that launch or the international tea drinking competition. You can see a lot of cups there, uh, unused as yet. In terms of the history of economics and psychology, it pains me to do this because I'm in the middle of writing a 300-year history. It, that's about as long as it's going to take me to write it, to be honest with you. But um, economics and psychology have interacted throughout, you know, go back easy, easily, e go back as far as the Scottish Enlightenment before that. And you've got great figures in the 20th century like Herbert Simon who belong uh, to many traditions. So when, when I hear things like, you know, is behavioural economics, psychology and new bottles and so on, I, I think if you really sit back and think about it, those statements don't make any sense in the sense that economics and psychology sort of peeled off of philosophy at different times in history and, and always sort of interacted with each other in different ways. Uh, and I think what's happening at the moment is they're coming back together. And uh, we've not yet figured out a good, a good phrase for it. We're calling it behavioural science. Um, but that, you know, that could mean many different things. But you are seeing a huge amount of uh, um, interaction uh, between the disciplines. I think Kahneman and Tversky certainly are uh, quite prominent and deservedly so in the, in the current debate. Um, but executive orders are big things in the States. So this is basically saying every federally funded project in the United States has to go through some sort of, whether you want to call it behavioral or psychological audit. So it really opens up, whether under the current regime or the next, it certainly opens up a massive uh, area for psychology. Um, I, I think it opens up areas of practice that are Staggering, really, if you think about them in their scale. We've had similar things before in economics, you know, around things like environmental economic evaluations and so on that really created whole sort of groups. Um, and again, we're seeing projects all across the world. Um, pension participation is a big one, simplification of tax and legal systems, and then stuff that, I guess, overlaps with what psychologists have always been working on, like health promotion and so on. Um, but, but as I said, increasingly seeing psychologists and economists who are trained in psychological research methods working in, in areas like tax authorities and so on. Uh, I think it has big implications for where psychology graduates can work and the type of things that psychologists will be doing uh, in, the in the next decade. Uh, I think there's an increasing professionalization of this area in government, teams being formed all around the world. Uh, and I think um, it also has implications for private, uh, for private concerns in terms of the ethical use of this in business.